Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peinecker. And folks, um, we, uh, we, we actually taped an interview yesterday on March 1st. Today is Saturday, March 2nd. And the reason why I had clear back on is because the powers that be uh, removed our interview. Um, I uploaded it and it was flagged and um, we had I had to take it down. And so we are abiding by the policies of, of the platform that we're using. And we are going to be more careful in how we discuss some of these sensitive topics. So essentially, um, we were I was told that um, that the episode did not meet the community guidelines vis-a-vis -vis some controversial things that have arisen in the last few years. So in this episode, we're going to uh, have a conversation, the same conversation we had yesterday, but we're going to be very careful on how we word this. Um, I think if anybody is, uh, you'll be under, I think you'll be able to understand what we're talking about. But because of the sensitivities of this whole issue and topic, and Claire um, uh, is somebody who knows this firsthand, Claire Dalton has a uh, podcast called The Clarity Podcast, and we're going to pop that up in a second here, but I just wanted to welcome you to the program. It's a new podcast, just got started, and we're going to talk about why you started the podcast, but before we do that, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me back on again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And what I'm going to do just briefly, I'm going to pop up the the the, the channel, and I'm going to uh, just kind of talk a little bit about, this is The Clarity Podcast. And now she's also on all different platforms. So, so I want you all to go and subscribe to the Clarity Podcast on YouTube. Also check it out on, on all the major podcast formats, including iTunes and Spotify and all that, and check that out. And we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about some of her episodes here on the channel. So make sure you're watching this because it's really important that you visually see what we're talking about in this episode. Uh, uh, Claire, I'm so thankful that you came on the program. You have a very unique and fascinating story. I told people after I had taped the interview, and I think I mentioned it to you, it was probably one of the most powerful interviews that I've ever taped here on NBR. Unfortunately, it will never see the light of day. But fortunately, we were able to have you back on to share your story, which needs to be told. This is a very, very, very important story that's happening a lot more frequently within Latter-day Saint circles and people maybe want to realize and so it's important that Claire tell her story. So Claire, I guess what we should do is just start from the beginning. Tell us about your background. You were raised in a very conservative, traditional Mormon household, but your parents are converts and you were born into this world. And you're, and and uh, just maybe just let's tell us a little about your background that will lead up to why you decided to do your podcast, the Clarity Podcast. Yep, definitely. So just so everybody knows, I'm 27 years old, single. Um, I am a farmer by profession. I manage my family's farm and I also am a sales representative for a monument company. And I'm also a president of a nonprofit organization. So I wear many hats in my life. And, you know, honestly, I'm really grateful for my Mormon background that taught me to labor and to work hard because, you know, I'm living a life that I feel is full because of it. And so just like what Steve just said, I was raised true blue Mormon, born under the covenant, as they would say. And um, my parents were converts to the church. And I checked all the boxes growing up. So I was baptized when I was eight years old. I received my patriarchal blessing when I was 14 years old. I got my young women's medallion when I was 16 years old. I was endowed in the temple when I was 19. And I actually was an ordinance worker when I was 22. So I checked all the boxes. And growing up, I actually really loved being raised Mormon. I Because my parents were converts to the church, um, they weren't so enveloped in culture that you see so commonly in Utah. And so my parents, they honored God, number one, in our in their lives, in their marriage, and in our family. And that was able to spread to us kids. And so I was able to be raised in a happy and healthy home. And I was able to be a kid, which, you know, we're seeing less and less in society where I was just able to be a happy, innocent kid. So I'm really grateful for being able to be raised in Mormonism. And I always find it really funny when people are like, oh, you were raised in a cult. I'm so sorry. And I'm like, well, it must have been a pretty good cult because I had a wonderful childhood. <laughs> and so um, then when I was about 12 years old, my dad was called to be bishop of our ward that we were living in at the time. And I remember feeling when he was called, like things were about to shift in our lives. And I was only 12, so I wasn't very old. And I was just perceiving things from, you know, the perspective of a kid. And um, 
I actually was really close to my dad growing up. Like we would always play card games in the evenings together. And that was how we would bond. And um, we hung out a lot. Like I was the youngest of six kids. And so I got a lot more time with my parents than the other kids did because they were all grown and getting married and moving on with their lives. And I was still at home. Um, so I remember my mom explaining to me when he was called to be bishop, you know, dad's not going to be home as much. And he's probably going to be gone on like Wednesday nights and probably Sunday nights. And turns out my dad was gone Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, Thursday nights, Friday nights, Saturday nights, and most of all of Sunday as well. And if we had Monday as a family, we were blessed. <laughs> and, you know, I was taught at the time that, you know, this was a sacrifice that we had to make for God and that dad was serving the Lord. And, you know, I really felt like he was serving the Lord and he was trying to live in accordance to what God would want him to do. And he he received this calling from the state president. And so he was going to fulfill this calling. Um, but I really felt the absence of my dad in my life because he was always gone doing church things. And I felt suddenly like the word was more important than me as a kid. And that's, that's how I was perceiving it. And so my dad was also a different bishop than some bishops, again, because my parents were not raised in Mormon culture. Um, basically, my dad was promoting the same things he was trying to teach us kids. So faith, sacrifice, consecration, um, laboring for the benefit of others. He was trying to teach these principles virtue. And because he was trying to teach these principles and trying to uphold these things within our ward and encourage activities and um, Sunday school lessons and things like that, um, that were upholding these good things, um, people did not respond to it very well. Um, people were very upset at some of the things that dad was trying to uphold. And as a result, we had people who spread a lot of gossip and slandered us to, to point, just say it. <laughs> That's basically what was happening. And so as a bishop's kid and from the perspective of a bishop's kid, everybody expects you to be one of two things. They either expect you to be absolutely perfect or they expect you to be absolutely horrible. And, you know, Claire, I, I want to interject here, too, because, of course, I talked about this on a previous uh, interview, but right. I've uh, interviewed my pastor and he was what was raised a PK, a preacher's kid. And he had similar experiences that you would have had right at the same age as you would have been. It would, he would have one week, he'd have very good friends and then the family would be mad at the pastor. So they'd leave the church and now the pastor's the devil. And it was really hard for him to be in that environment and had to deal. And as a matter of fact, that's what kept him from even wanting to get into the ministry was because of that, um, you know, that, 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 those kind of pressures that were put on the fan, even on the family. And of course he wanted to have a family. So he, 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 he actually resisted the calling for a very long time to be a pastor because of what he went through as a PK, in your case, a BK. So I just want to give some context on that as well. Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, I was expected to be perfect or horrible. And, you know, I was a teenager. So as a result, I was neither. <laughs> okay. I tried really hard to be a good kid and to do my best. And I, I loved God when I was young. I, I wanted to please God, but I was a teenager and I made mistakes. I made rookie mistakes. Um, but I found that people were coming after me for things that I either wasn't doing or things that were not sinful. Like I remember a girl in high school flagging me down just to tell me that I shouldn't be holding hands with a boy in the hallways. And when did holding hands become breaking the law of chastity? And she made it very clear that I was a bishop's so I shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these were things that I just felt like at the time, well, that's a little strange. I didn't think that was breaking the law of chastity. Um, I guess I could talk to my dad who's a bishop about it. <laughs> that just seems really silly, you know? And so things got so bad and gossip spread so hard, not just throughout my ward, but then throughout my school that I had to switch schools. And I remember going to my mom and saying, mom, this is awful. And I'm either going to be a high school dropout or we're going to switch schools. So like, get me out of this. I hate this. <laughs> and um, my parents were always my greatest supporters. And even though dad wasn't around as much, he still went to bat for me for many, many things, which I will always be grateful for. Um, and so I ended up switching schools and I went to an LDS private school. And, you know, I learned from that school that there's no such thing as a perfect school, no matter how much it looks like it's perfect on the internet. <laughs> there's no such thing as a perfect school. I had really wonderful teachers and I had not so wonderful teachers. I had wonderful friends and I had not so wonderful friends. Sure. And so that was my experience in an LDS school. And I learned a lot. And the thing that that school really instilled in me was making the gospel something that was part of your everyday life. 
Mm -hmm. Gospel is no longer just a Sunday thing. I was going to classes and we were beginning with prayer and hymns and um, my core class, which is English and history. We talked all about gospel principles, about morals, about um, living in alignment with God's word. And I, I loved that about that school. It really helped me to make God a part of my heart every single day. And so then I graduated high school. And while I was in high school, my mom got really, really sick. And so I was also navigating this thing in high school where my mom was really sick and I wasn't sure every single day when I came home from school, whether or not mom was going to be alive or not because she was that sick. And so that ward that dad was bishop in, I was in that ward for a while while I was going to my private school. But after a while, mom was so sick that dad was praying about it. And God basically said to him, you know, you can keep, you can stay being a bishop or you can choose to resign and take care of your wife. But if you stay a bishop, you're going to lose your wife because she was that sick. And my dad, praise God, chose his wife. And so he resigned as bishop. And we actually left that house in the middle of the night because we were so sick of it. We were so sick of everything that was happening. And there were so many um, evil forces against us, as was one way to put it, um, that um, we just left in the middle of the night and we went and stayed with my family and we eventually found a house in another area. Um, mm. And that really started my mom's chronic illness journey and also my own chronic illness journey. So when I was in high school, I had health problems and, you know, they were manageable, though I didn't have any major things that kept me in bed or kept me from going to school, um, besides a few weird things that happened when I was out of school for like a month. Um, but I was sick enough that my mom had received her diagnosis when I was about 18. And so I was having these bizarre things happen. And so we went to go get my diagnosis and they just did a whole bunch of blood tests on me. And before I even got the results of the blood tests, basically I went to college and, um, at college, I just declined hardcore. I got so sick in college and I was on scholarship. So I was taking, you know, 18 credit hours, trying to keep my scholarships and trying to hang on for dear life because I had so many symptoms. I had joint pain. I had muscle pain. I had um, headaches. I had heart palpitations. I had pain in my heels. I had terrible cognitive dysfunction and brain fog. I couldn't remember anything that I was being taught. Um, I had air hunger, which you guys don't know what that is. It's basically, you feel like you can't breathe, even though you're breathing just fine. You feel like you can't breathe. Um, <laughs> I came home and I lost 20 pounds in college. I am five, nine and I weighed 130 pounds and I lost 20 pounds. I came home at 110 pounds. Nobody who's five, nine should be that thin. Um, and I was so frail. I lost like all my muscle mass and my hair was falling out, came home with a rash on my face mm. and I didn't even finish my first semester of college. My mom called me and was like, Claire, this is your diagnosis. And this is what the doctor said. And, um, he thinks that you should come home. And at first I was pretty stubborn. I am pretty stubborn. <laughs> and um, I was like, we're just going to start treatment. And I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing school. Cause I really, I really want to keep doing school. I'm an adult. I need to be in school. And um, so I started my treatments and that made it so much worse in the sense that I had to sleep with oxygen tubes at night. I had to get up. I had to rate all of my symptoms from one to 10. So my doctors could see them. I had to take all these treatment protocols and then I had to attend all my classes and I had to somehow make some kind of a grade, which I was flunking out of all my classes anyway. And I barely had time at this point to take a shower, let alone take care of myself because I had so much going on. And so I got home from college and I remember just falling on the floor and laying on the floor and thinking, thank you, Lord, for letting me come home because that was awful. Like I was not in college for long, but that was awful. Mm. And I actually always planned to go back to college, but um, the more I learned staying home, the more I realized I don't need to go back to college. And so I did it. And my journey of chronic illness was actually a lot longer than I ever planned in that I was bedridden for bedridden, couch ridden, homebound, whatever you want to call it. I guess I could move around my house and I occasionally went to church, <laughs> but, um, I, I was bedridden for about three years before I was really up and about and able to kind of function again. Wow. And so I came home and I started all these treatments and some of them made me really sick. And so I got worse and some of them made me better, but it was very, very slow going. So I just wanted to highlight here. Um, we have to be very sensitive here, but I want you to notice these episodes. She did it, her first couple episodes detail um, her condition. 
And I'm not going to say the name of it, but if you're looking at the screen here, you can see what we're talking about. And so that's the, the, this is not the only reason why we um, uh, received the attention of the powers that be, but this was certainly probably a factor. So we want to talk about this uh, chronic condition that she has, but we don't want to give too many details because uh, my channel, um, I, I don't want to have any anything happen to the channel. Let's just put it that way. Okay, continue, Claire. Okay, so all this begs the question, so what was the church's response to this illness that I was fighting and to what was going on and what did I do about church? Um, a lot of the times when I first got home from college, I tried really hard to push through and go to church, go to church activities. I attended the local YSA ward and I tried really hard to be normal because I felt like I had to be normal. And I don't even know what was making me feel like I had to be normal besides the pressures in culture. And I tried so hard to pretend I was normal, but even, you know, I went to that ward in the summer and when I came back so fast, everybody was like, what happened? <laughs> and, you know, explaining my illness and what was going on, you're usually met with some kind of a look that is like, oh, <laughs> nobody knows what to say. Um, and after a while, um, I kind of gave up trying to be normal because I realized that I wasn't normal and people didn't know how to respond to what was going on in my life. It was really hard. They didn't know how to respond to the hardship. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't find some wonderful people who were very kind to me. I found I found a few, um, but it was still just this overall thing of that we have no idea how to respond to somebody who is suffering on this level. And if we're talking about leadership in the church, bishops definitely do not know how to how to respond to somebody suffering on this level. And you know, so and I want to and, and I, I want to interject here too because you know I want I want to say that I. I, we need to also acknowledge that this is very common in many other church settings as well. It's not just the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, but there are many people in the evangelical world um, who suffer and they feel abandoned by the church people and by their church as well. So let's just acknowledge that this is something I think we could all do better at and work on and to remember that Jesus was there where there was suffering. And we as Christians need to follow the example of the Savior. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I'm heavily involved in the chronic illness community online. That's where my nonprofit rests. And that's, um, I talk to people all, all over the world with all kinds of chronic conditions. And a lot of them are Christians. I like, I probably only have, I don't know, maybe two or three Mormon followers on my social media that runs my nonprofit. And most of them are Christians, but their story is the same across the board, um, where they just felt totally abandoned by their religious community. So I guess for me, what came as a shock is that growing up, I was a really dedicated Mormon girl. and I was taught um, over the pulpit and at lessons in Sunday school and even at general conference that we're supposed to be taking care of the sick. We're supposed to be serving people. We're supposed to be helping people. We're supposed to be loving people. And there was almost none of that from the church members, except for a few, because there are always a few who break that rule, right? But there was almost none. And so what does the church do for those who are sick? Well, they don't do anything. They just ignore it. And on top of that, on top of ignoring it, they also have plenty of things to say about it. Um, you know, maybe you're not praying hard enough. Maybe you don't have enough faith to be healed, all these things. And eventually I realized that I don't have much community at this point with this illness, but there was nothing I could do about it. I was really bedridden and I was tired of trying to beg people to listen to me and to understand what I was going through. I was sick of it. And so when you realize that all you have is Jesus and I had my parents in this journey too, which I'm so grateful because I don't think I ever would have made it. Um, but besides that, I realized, you know, all I have is God. And so when I was 18, that's when I started getting really serious about scripture study and getting really serious about understanding what's in his word, because I had questions. I wanted to know, why is God doing this to me? Why am I suffering so bad? My friends are out living their lives. They're getting married. They're having children. They're going to college. They're getting jobs. And I can't do any of those things. And why would God do this to me? And the emotional peril that you undergo as a young person, when you're experiencing this, you feel completely in darkness on some days, on a lot of days. And so I remember talking to God about all these emotions at one point and God said to me, Claire, number one, keep talking to me about it. And number two, stay in my word, stay in my word. I was like, okay, all right, well, that's what I'm going to do. And so what I started doing actually is I started reading general conference talks from the eighties and the nineties. So the older general conference talks. 
And I read conference talks very differently in that I annotated every single talk. And every single time there was a scripture reference in a talk, I would look it up in the scriptures and I would read it and make sure I understood context and doctrine and what it was trying to say. And so I was having these beautiful experiences with these older conference addresses. And I have probably about three binders full of annotated general conference addresses from the 80s and 90s. And um, basically, then I started listening to the recent general conference addresses. And, you know, I remember being so sick and in so much pain. And I remember general conference Sunday where I'm laying in a bathtub and basically boiling water because it's the only thing that will bring my pain down, listening to one of the members of the general authorities talk about suffering. And I wanted to throw something at my TV because I felt like, do you have any idea what you're even talking about? <laughs> because we can repeat all these nice phrases and we can say that we need to have faith and we need to trust God and we need to do all these things. But the practical life advice that I was getting in those old conference talks was not being given in these newer ones. Mm. It was basically repeated nice phrases over and over and over again. And it drove me crazy. Um, but, you know, I was a really dedicated church member. Nothing was going to keep me from staying in the church. I was like, it's fine. Like, I'm just Oh, and gonna... you know, just real quick, I, I want you to maybe talk about some of your favorite uh, general conference speakers in the 80s and 90s that really uh, were, affected you. Sure. Yeah. So Neely Maxwell is like one of my favorites. Um, I read probably like so many talks from him and I actually own like a ton of his books, Spencer W. Kimball, um, people like that, where they're the powerhouses. They taught correct principles and they, I believe that they were men who really loved God um, because based off of what they wrote and the advice that they were giving the members to align their lives with God and to honor God, that, that really resonated with me. And that is one of the things that helped me get through all of this hell that I was going through with my illness. I was afraid I wasn't going to live for very long. I was afraid I was going to lose my life at a young age. And that changes you. Okay. And then we're also talking about, you're going through major traumatic experiences on the daily with this illness. Like we're talking about pain that is so bad that all you can do is scream. And once you've heard the screams in your life, you never go back. It changes you forever. It changes the kind of person that you are and it changes how you choose to spend your time. Hmm. And so I heard the screams from my mother and I was the one screaming many, many times and it changed my life. Okay. So, you know, all these things that were starting to come together in my mind where I was like, you know, that's a little strange that, you know, they're not really saying what needs to be said. They're not talking about issues that need to be talked about, but whatever, I'm going to stay in the church. And um, I got better over time. I got a little bit better just with lots of work, lots of effort. <laughs> and I ended up going back to the singles ward. And this is when we actually made the move to the farm, which is where I live now. And I attended the singles ward. And I actually was called the gospel doctrine, which was fantastic. I actually really loved teaching gospel doctrine because I was in God's word all the time and it actually made it so I was more in God's word. And I was, I realized, you know, I don't understand the old Testament as well as I should understand it. And, um, I was told to teach by come follow me, but to me, come follow me was boring and watered down. So, you know, I pulled all kinds of things from old conference talks, from old quotes, from, I had binders and journals full of my studies. I had so much to share and I loved it. And I hope that it touched some people's lives and in some of the Sunday school lessons that I was able to teach all glory to God here. Like I didn't really do anything. It's just that God taught me stuff. And then I was able to teach other people. And it was so wonderful. And, you know, I had bishops that would say things to me like, Claire, you know more about the gospel than, than I know. And, and I know that. And so bless their hearts for being humble, but it also kind of struck me that how come, how come bishops don't understand as much about the gospel as I do when I'm like 24 years old? It didn't really make too much sense to me. And so, you know, I was also still facing illness at this time where, you know, I was up and down a lot. And so, you know, I'd ask a lot of questions like, you know, like, what if I come to church and I don't feel recharged? Like everybody talks about, I feel this spiritual recharge when I go to church. And I was like, I don't feel that. I feel exhausted after I go to church. I was like, so Bishop, like, how come that's what I'm feeling? How come the talks that are being spoken over the pulpit have almost nothing, if I guess if not nothing, very little to do with scripture. I gave a talk once in sacrament meeting and someone came up to me and they were like, I really loved that you you used scripture in your talk. <laughs> I knew that they said that because 
the talks rarely use scripture anymore because we're told to speak on conference talks. We're giving talks about talks. And I was like, why are we giving talks about talks? Doesn't that bore the living daylights out of anybody besides just me? But those were questions you're not allowed to ask. And if you do ask, they just kind of, hmm, well, we don't, we don't really know that, Claire. We don't, we don't have to ask those questions. Mm. Okay. All right. So, you know, I kept, I kept going to church and I kept teaching Sunday school and I loved it. So now I want everybody to rewind back to about four years ago. Okay. We all know what happened four years ago. Okay. okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's see how we phrase this. So there was a major event that kind of changed the world dramatically that caused pe that was a major disruptor in people's lives. And it caused a lot of people to reassess a lot of things in their lives, including vis-a-vis -vis their relationship uh, with their with their with their religion. Uh, it it kind of it did have an effect on on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and 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 kind of changed the direction. And then there were actions that were done by the leadership of the church that some people found very concerning. And uh, and there were red flags put up. Uh, is that a good maybe way of approaching it like that? Yeah, that's talking? a pretty good way of approaching. It. Yeah, uh huh. That's a good okay. way of approaching it. So we all know what happened four years ago. It's not a secret. Okay, it happened to everybody. It affected everybody. And it's just like what Steve just said. It affected everybody in their religion. And so I had already gone through this chronic illness journey, and I had already experienced things within our sick care system that basically I realized there were things wrong in that system because when you have the illness that i had i was told that there is no illness that has that has your symptoms there is no you know there's nothing that has that many symptoms or you know it's all in your head or you just want attention it's not even recognized as a disease in our system and i talk to hundreds and thousands of people through my nonprofit every day who suffer from the exact same disease that i have and so to shove it down like it doesn't exist well, there's obviously some corruption going on in that system. And so this chronic illness is kind of the gateway to understanding the corruption in our world. So, you know, I understood the corruption from that system. And then, you know, you start to eat healthy and you start to see the corruption in the food industry. And then and then you start to wonder, well, where is all this stuff coming from? How are people learning these things? And then you start to see the corruption in academia and what people are being taught in schools. And then all of a sudden, one day, you start to see these patterns of corruption in your church. And then you're like, wait a minute. Mm, but okay. my church. Let's, let's go and Ryan tape a little bit here because I, I want to maybe address this a little bit. So I'm not into conspiracies or anything like that. I mean, I'd like to talk about conspiracy theories and stuff, and I'm interested in them, but I don't I, I I'm 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 a person who firmly believes in like the, the, the established facts so we can understand them. Fact the sugar industry played a major role in affecting our the way people eat in America. They recognize, they gave us this false idea that fat makes you fat. They say, so fat makes you fat, so you need to eat not a whole lot of fat, but you can eat sugar, which of course we all know is sugar is what makes you fat. So as a result of having this upside down food pyramid and, 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 and looking at people like Dr. Atkins, who was advocating a low carb lifestyle, um, eating meat. Uh, you know, that that's okay, or fat is okay, it's not your enemy, because it takes, and just so you know, it takes longer for your body to digest fat than it does sugar. And so as it because it takes longer, it doesn't become fat. But if you eat sugar, and if you're not running and exercising right away, it immediately, it very quickly gets stored as fat to be, to be used as an energy uh, for later. And so we have this whole society now in which we have a lot of sick people eating uh, food that's not good for them, we also realize that a lot of a lot of the the additives and chemicals that are put in our food are banned in Europe, right? Um, so you have the so we have all these big corporations that are making us cheap food. That I sometimes argue: Are we even eating food anymore? That are kind of arguing can be made that many of us aren't. And so, so you have we do. This is not some made up conspiracy theory. These are realities that all anybody can 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 do their own research and realize that yeah yeah, big sugar. Uh, gave us the food pyramid, essentially influenced our government so that, so that, and then now, of course, they've since adjusted because just the science is so overwhelming, the evidence is so overwhelming, they can't deny it anymore. Um, and then you have this whole situation where you have all these sick people who have all these chronic diseases and conditions in large part because of the diets they're eating. And guess what? We have this other big corporation that's there. Hey, we got something for you. We got some, some pills you can take. 
And again, look, is medicine good? I'm not anti-medicine. Does it help people? Does it cure people? Absolutely, no question. But I think we can also acknowledge that there is a, that we are an over-prescribed country. That that not only that, we all can all everybody acknowledges anti antibiotics are overprescribed, and we and we find that doctors use prescriptions almost as a way to as a shield to protect them. Like, well, if I didn't offer them this prescription, they might sue me if they got sick, right? So there's this whole this whole system's geared towards basically taking people and getting them medicated. And I will just say, talk about one last thing, and then I'm going to hand the, the podium back to Claire, is that, I, and I've told this story on other platforms too, is that in the, in the 90s, uh, Bill Clinton, the state he, one of the states he did the best in was West Virginia, both in 92 and 96, Bubba, okay? He's, he's big in West Virginia. And what Bubba does right in between his, his, his two election campaigns is he signs into a law, this free trade agreement called NAFTA. Now, some people argue NAFTA was a good thing. Okay, that's fine. You can argue on paper. You can make arguments that NAFTA was good. But what, what people have to acknowledge, and everybody, and again, this is another fact. The fact is, is that NAFTA decimate, decimated the manufacturing base in the Midwest. And so now we have this whole Midwest, including West Virginia, that have our decimated communities, factory towns that are shut down. And guess what happens? comes in and basically gets these people addicted to drugs over the course of the last couple of decades. This is, again, this is all factual. So now what's so interesting to me is that the very state that was, and so that's why I say in one sense, I think Bill Clinton betrayed his own people, is that now who did they vote for in 2016 and 2020? The, the state that did the best for Trump in both elections, just like it did for Bill Clinton, West Virginia. Now I'm not a Trump guy. I've, I've made it very clear. I'm not a big, I'm not a Trump fan at all. However, for those of you who are haters, of Trump supporters, you have to recognize one thing. These are traumatized, traumatized people who have been who were betrayed by their working class blue collar power party who decided they were going to go corporate. OK, these are all facts. I don't think there's anything here that people could disagree with. And and so so you need to be more empathetic to people who have who do support Donald Trump because they are a people who are who have been basically screwed over by their, their by their government and their country and in many ways. And this is how and again, this is how they feel. So we need to understand and have more empathy for people that may have different political values, keeping in mind that millions of these people voted for Bill Clinton and probably millions of them voted for Barack Obama. So I don't think it's unfair to paint people with a uh, wide brush here. Claire, I'm sorry. I had to, I had to, I, I think it's really important that we establish that so that people can understand where you're coming from. This is the world that you were born in. This is the, the society that you live in and how you feel like it kind of let you down as well. All right, continue with your story. <laughs> and maybe you want to talk yeah. about mention just maybe uh, uh, deal with what some of the stuff I said as well. Yeah, yeah, you're good. And and you have to understand too that, you know, in my journey, you see the corruption because, you know, they, they give you, they give you the medicine that is supposed to help you and it makes you sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. And so there's all these treatments that um that do work that help us to get better. And they're not even covered by insurance. So most of these people who have this chronic illness that I've had, they are paying every dime they have out of pocket and they don't have any instruction. They don't have anybody helping them. They don't have anybody helping them. And so what did they do? Well, they turn to each other and that that's what we've done in this community of people who are chronically ill, but it doesn't change the fact that there's a lot of suffering going on. And that's, that's pretty messed up if you ask me. And so what do you do when one day you wake up and you realize that there's just as much corruption in your religious system as there is in all of the other systems in our country? And so this is what I was faced with. So back four years ago, um, the church hopped right in line with everything that the powers that be were forcing us to do. The church hopped right in line and told us that we were supposed to be doing these things. And so in my mind, why are we doing the opposite of what scripture instructs us to do? Jesus didn't stay away from sick people. Jesus went amongst lepers who that was considered very contagious back in his day. And he touched them. He went amongst them and scripture shows us that we're supposed to be suckering people. We're supposed to be mourning with people. We're supposed to be binding up wounds. And all that happened was that people who were already isolated became more isolated and that really damaged a lot of people. And so all that was happening and it, it brought up all these questions. Why is the church hopping in line with all these things? So then, then, then everything is rolled out. These experimental interventions that came out 
pretty sure y'all know picking up what I'm throwing down here. <laughs> they were rolled out and we were told that these things are safe and effective. Okay. Now, so let me let me just step in and give some perspective here, folks. Of course, I actually at the time did go ahead and receive this one of these uh, treatments, if you will, if you want to call it that. And I, I am not anti this. I'm not. I've, I've made it clear I'm not anti, but I do think that it's important that Claire's story be told because I have been over the course of me doing this channel, I have run into a lot of people who have a similar story. That when the church did this, it caused their shelves to get a little heavy, and they started questioning everything about what they were being told. And these are people more from a conservative perspective. These are people who are also believers in God. And these are people that are had, this was their moment where it kind of changed the, the way they perceived their relationship with the church. Now, I can tell you, I could give you names that you would all know, some very, very big names in, in the, that that have been on major podcasts, including mine, um, you would know who they are, and that's not all these stories have been publicly told. But I will assure you, folks, that a lot of people have privately told me similar stories to Claire. So I think it's important that Claire is going public to tell her perspective because we need to hear the have the full picture here. Unfortunately, we have to be careful about what we say, but I do think it's important. That's why we're retaping because it's really important people hear this message. Okay, Claire, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify. Oh, you're good. So I want to jump a little bit into my my background with these experimental interventions, is what I'm going to call them. And basically, when I was a kid. We all know what we have to get when we are children and when we're born and what is required in order to go to school and all these things. And so I have been trying to figure out what, what is it that has made me so sick? I've been trying to figure that out for years and I've been praying on it for years because there's gotta be something. You don't just, you're not just a perfectly normal kid one day. And then the next day you drop down and you don't get back up. And so while I was taking these to God and trying to understand these answers, I, I had a dream one night and it was more of even a memory where I saw this happening to receive my childhood, you know what's, and I received five all in my hips. And then I woke up from this dream and I went to my mom and I said, mom, when I was about five or six or seven, did this happen to me? And we actually, this was back when they had the little cards that kept records of these things. And my mom pulled out my little card and sure enough, um, five or six, all in my hips. So let me explain a little bit about my specific health struggles. My health struggles are specifically in my reproductive system. Endometriosis is a female chronic illness that is an infection of the uterus and ovaries. And what it does is it causes intense pain in, amongst women. And so what I've had is I've had the period from hell ever since I was about 15 years old. And when I say the period from hell, I mean the period from hell. I have been, I've had pain so bad that it brings a full grown woman to her knees mm. in so much pain that I am spending three to five days out of every single month, puking my guts out and having seizures and hemorrhaging essentially. And this is what it's been like for me for as long as I was old enough to have a period. And so after you know, after you know that this is what has caused it and that you were never the same ever again after having that done to you, if the prophet is going to come out and say that something like that is safe and effective, and I was just like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'm sure it is, that would make me a pretty messed up person after everything I've been through. And here's the thing. There's arguments on both sides about these things. And I understand that. And the advice I can give you is dig, dig for truth when it comes to this. And that's pretty much all I can say on, on this platform, but you're not going to find the truth on these mainstream things. So dig to find the truth, because I'll tell you, there are people suffering. There are people that die. And so to use the word safe and effective, even if it was to kill just one person, do we not value that one person's life enough to say, that was a lie that it's safe and effective. And, you know, okay. you always get, you always get these arguments that people are like, well, the church was probably just trying to get in line. So the church wouldn't have repercussions that they had to face with. And my answer to that is that if these people are true prophets, where in scripture do they, do true prophets get in line for any reason? Because in scripture, we have prophets who are 
escaping into the wilderness and dying for the sake of God and the sake of truth. And I knew this because I had already studied my scriptures. I had gotten the answers that my bishops were not giving me. I, I understood why I was suffering. I understood why I had to go through these things. It tells us in God's word very clearly. And so when the church got in line and used these words safe and effective, woe unto the liar, for he shall be thrust down to hell. So what do we do when we're in this situation where our leadership, the prophet who will never lead us astray, lead us astray is lying to us. And that's, that's the decision that I had to face. Okay. So I life. just want to make it really clear here because I have a large audience of people who are faithful members of the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. I know that some of the stuff that Claire is saying to you probably is upsetting to you, but I do think it's important that you at least hear her story, hear where she's coming in from and hear her perspective, because there are probably many people that, you know, family and friends that have maybe taken a similar journey as Claire's. And so it's really important that I, you know, I have, I have people that have left the church come on my program all the time. Um, and I, I think it's important and, and, and you're not going to probably watch if these people go on Mormon stories, you're probably not going to watch them, but you're going to probably watch them on my program because you know that I'm going to be fair and I'm not going to try to weaponize their story to attack the church. You know, I'm more about having good conversations, but it's also really important that we hear, you may not agree with everything Claire is saying granted. Okay. But just listen to the story and have an open mind, and then you decide how you want to deal with it, but at least hear her out. Okay, Claire, because now, uh, yeah, let's we'll continue, because now this is kind of leading to why you decided to do a podcast, and why you're trying to build a community of similar people, and how you feel like this is a community that's an underserved community that doesn't have really any place to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I stopped going to church at this time, four years ago, when all these things were happening. I stopped going to church um, and me and my parents would have at home church, which everybody was doing at home church for a while. And then all of a sudden when at home church stopped, all of a sudden it wasn't okay to do at home church anymore, but I knew that these things were going on and I no longer wanted to support something that I know is evil and that I know is harming people. And so, um, I stopped going to church, but in my mind, I always thought to myself, I'm always going to stay in the church though. I am dedicated. <laughs> I'm going to stay in the church. And all these things took me on this beautiful journey with God for God to show me the things that are maybe not so right in the church. And I started asking myself these questions, you know, why is it that we don't actually serve people who are helping? Why is it that what's being preached over the pulpit is the opposite of what is being done? Why is it that we have to pay 10% of our tithing to get into a temple when the scriptures teach the law of consecration, which is a little bit different. Um, all of these things were big questions in my head that God was answering through his word. And the evils in the church were big. They were big when I really looked into it. You know, where's our tithing money going? Why is it not going to help the poor? These, these are, were big questions and big issues. And so I removed my records from the church about a year ago. And this was a journey that I took with God. And in all honesty, it was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made. You are so dedicated when you are in the church to the church. I was dedicated. I was an ordinance worker at one point. I, I was dedicated to wearing the temple garment. I was dedicating to doing all these things. And I honestly, I shed tears when I realized that some of these church things I had to give up to follow God at a closer level. And so I gave them up and I removed my records and I felt extreme freedom in Christ when I finally took that step to remove my records. Okay, well, this is a fascinating story that you're telling. And I do want to also just mention, too, is during this period of time when there was a lot of tumultuous things going on in the church and the church was sending out messages that a lot of the people from the more conservative perspective were bothered by. I remember uh, there was a very prominent person who's been on my program who wrote an article essentially saying that you don't have to listen to the prophet on this one. Uh, that uh, when it comes to this whole situation, which is mind blowing, because that would never, the progressives would go and say, you don't need to listen to the prophet. But that's never, it was one of those rare instances where on the right it happened. And not only that, but then you had more conservative members even burning their temple recommends and posting it online because of their anger towards the church. So this is all established real world stuff. This is what's really happening. Claire is one of those people that's going through this at this time. So you decide that you uh, you remove your uh, name your name from the records about a year ago, and then recently you, you decided to start a podcast and talk about 
what made you decide to start it and what kind of and your hopes hope your hope is to build a community so talk a little bit about that yeah absolutely so my podcast is called the clarity podcast and it's all about finding clarity through christ so i've been on this long journey where i've been exploring all kinds of groups all kinds of people all kinds of situations that people are in and what i've been seeing and the biggest message the biggest voices i guess is what i should say the biggest voices that i've been hearing um are you have these two groups of people that are true blue Mormons. And then you have this group of people that is ex Mormon. Okay. And so the messages of the true blue Mormons are, you know, we need to be in the church. We need to follow the prophet. We need to go to the temple. We need to fulfill our church callings. And to me, all of those things are petty and they're not actually the gospel of Jesus Christ as according to scripture. Okay. But then you have the ex Mormons that are on the opposite end. Okay. And there's ex-Mormons that are promoting sin and they are putting down, throwing the baby out with the bathwater to say they don't believe in the Book of Mormon. They don't believe in the Bible. There's no God. And both of these voices on social media are so, so loud. And so for me, I have met some amazing people who are my, in my exact same position. They see the corruption in the church and they left the church to follow Christ they didn't leave to throw everything out and to uphold sin, but they didn't stay because you have to, because you're in the church. And so what I'm trying to do with the Clarity Podcast, what I'm trying to do with the Clarity Podcast is bring these people on who have beautiful testimonies of Jesus Christ and who have left the church so that they can tell their story. And so on the Clarity Podcast, what do we, what do we stand for? Okay, well, we uphold the morals that are taught in scripture. So we uphold integrity, we uphold honesty, we uphold virtue. And why is it important that we uphold any of those things? Well, I wanna jump back to a little bit of my history again. And I wanna share a story that happened to me that was very, very eye-opening. So when I was about 20 years old, I was engaged to the man that I thought was the love of my life. And um, essentially, Sorry, I almost laugh at that phrase and I thought he was the love of my life because it's been so long <laughs> since mm -hmm. that time. But um, essentially, I found pornography all over his phone um, about a week before we were to be married. And um, so many things happened. And I found out that he had a major pornography problem and he had lied to me about it many, many times. And um, essentially, I called my wedding off because I wasn't raised in this world that it's okay to be married and then to be indulging in pornography. And what happened is I decided that I couldn't find anybody online who had experienced anything similar to what I had experienced. And so I thought, why are there no voices for this at all? And so I decided that I was gonna write my story and I put it on my blog about how I called my wedding off because of porn. And um, a big major news company ended up picking up on it and it became a viral news story. And so there's two things that happen when you go viral, especially about something that is so controversial, like indulging in porn. And so you have supporters and then you have haters. So the first thing that I was faced with was a flood of haters. I received so many messages and DMs and emails from people hating on me and insulting me and telling me how awful I was because of my stance against porn. But this was a very eye-opening experience to me because not only did I, I get to experience that, but I also received hundreds, if not thousands of emails from women all over the world, no matter their religious background. But we're talking like, I talked to people in Australia, many people in Australia, actually, and women would tell me their stories about their husbands who were indulging in porn and how much abuse and hurt that these women went through because their husbands had been indulging in porn for years. And these women expressed to me how before now, before I wrote my articles, they never had a voice. They never had a voice and they never felt like they could talk about it. But the abuse that they underwent is getting unbearable. And they thanked me for finally feeling like they had a voice for that particular topic. And so what I'm seeing here is a problem when society starts to uphold things like pornography and sexual sin. We have a major problem because if you read scripture and you understand the history of scripture, you understand that societies literally crumble when morals crumble. And 
morals are crumbling in our society. There's no more of that. But what I see is I see that when you have a couple that is upholding their morals and upholding what God instructs us to do in his word, you have happy couples, you have happy marriages, you have happy kids, you have safe kids. And then those kids are able to grow up and be happy, safe, healthy adults. And we're seeing that diminish in our society. And so what happens when I see Mormons leaving the church and then they're upholding sin, pornography, sexual sin, how are these ex-Mormons any better than these Mormons who there are things going on in the church that are not okay, that are hurting people. But if you're promoting something like pornography, that's hurting people too. So this is what I see in these two groups. And yes, I'm totally making blanket statements here. There are people all in between um, these two, to these two groups that I'm right. explaining. Here. I think it's important. Yeah. yeah. That we, we, we also acknowledge the individuals in the, in these yes. groups and, 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 and honor their dignity and, 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 and the fact that they are all image bearers. And we need to be aware of that as well. But yeah, I think in, in general, general speaking, what you're saying is that you will have one side that, you know, basically says in order for you to serve Christ, you need to be in the church. And you have the other side that basically saying, well, we've left the church and we're just going to service ourselves. Right. And so you kind of have this. And so you have this this community in between that does, a group of people that doesn't have doesn't feel that they're welcome in either one of these communities. And so you're trying to establish a place, a, you know, like with what I've done with NBR, it's become a community. You know, this is a community. It's a very unique community because it is a very diverse community. But you, and then actually, when you stop and think about it, Claire, this is probably about the only podcast you could go on to talk about it because it, because it's either you're one way or another. And so I think it's really important that Claire's voice, even though I look, I don't agree with everything Claire said, I but I'm, I'm and you probably don't agree with everything she said, too. But I think a lot of what she said probably resonates with a lot of people, whether we're wherever you're at. And so you so tell me. I'm just curious, like your plans, what, what are you planning on doing with the podcast? Like uh, what kind of guests, maybe you could even uh, maybe preview some future guests that you're planning to have on the program. Sure. Yeah. So maybe, will I be, well, do you think you will have me on maybe? I don't maybe know. so. Who knows? Maybe, maybe know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I'm seeing within these two groups of people. So you have the true blue Mormons. Okay. And yep. what they're doing is they're engaging with their faith. And they're only engaging with their faith. And so what does that do? Well, it means that they're turning their head from suffering, which is what I was experiencing. I was seeing people turn their heads from suffering. And so they engage with their faith. But the problem is that because they're only engaging with their faith, their faith becomes something that is artificial. They don't really understand what exactly it was that Jesus did for us because we're so stuck on engaging with our faith and we don't want to look at the suffering. Okay. Then we have these people in the ex-Mormon community where they're engaging with their pain and they're engaging with their pain so hard that what we're seeing is bitter, angry people who are promoting sin. Okay. So what I want to promote here is that we have to engage with both. Okay. You have to engage with your pain and your faith. You have to engage with both because when you engage with both, you come to this beautiful understanding of what Jesus Christ did for us. When Jesus Christ was hanging on that cross for us in Calvary, he was engaging with his faith when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's got to be like the most faithful thing ever to do that when these people are killing you and torturing you, taking your life, right? But he also was engaging with his pain because there's nothing more painful than what Christ bore for us. And he did that for us so that we don't have to be alone. And so we have to engage with both of those things so we come to a deep and rich understanding of who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us, and how that practically empowers us in our lives to be, able, to be able to live in alignment with him and his word. And so these are the kind of people that I want to bring onto my podcast, the people who realize that there are things wrong in the church. We don't have to participate in cultish, cultish practices in order to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't have to be attached to an evil corporation or an evil system. And our authority from God is not gone because we're not in an evil system. Okay, but then the message is also saying to those who are giving it all up, 
you don't have to give it all up. God loves you and he is waiting for you to return to him with open arms. He is waiting for you with open arms. You don't have to give it all up because there is beauty and richness when we when we partner with God in our lives. And so these are the kind of people that I'm going to bring on my podcast is the people who are learning this in their journey and realizing that I love God, but there are things that are wrong and I no longer want to uphold the things that are wrong. And so this journey that I've been on is almost like walking on a tightrope. You're walking this thin line with God, the straight and narrow. <laughs> and no, that doesn't mean that those of us who are on this path are perfect at being on this straight and narrow. We're not. Okay. But we're walking almost this tightrope. And you have these people and these groups that are coming along and they're constantly pushing, 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 trying to push you onto their side. And what I'm trying to say is that rarely are you going to find all of the truth in anything mainstream. This is what Jesus did. The world was going that way and Jesus went that way. And that's essentially what these people are doing is they're realizing Maybe I don't fit into mainstream, but maybe I'm not supposed to. And all along my journey, I've had so many people say this to me. Well, Claire, you put yourself in this impossible position. Like you basically don't fit anywhere because of what you've chosen to do. And you hear that so many times from people or people telling you, well, Claire, like everyone who leaves the church is, you know, they kind of go crazy after a while. That's not true. There are beautiful people who have left the Mormon church and who love God and are trying to serve God and do the best that they can in their lives. And I would encourage everybody to get on this journey with God and to partner with God. Because when you do that, healing comes, peace comes, miracles come. And that's what I've seen in my life since leaving the church. And even just since starting this podcast, every single time I interview somebody, it's incredible. Their stories, their stories are incredible, but they're not being heard anywhere. They're being silenced. They're being silenced by mainstream media. They're being silenced by mainstream Mormons, mainstream ex-Mormons, mainstream Christians. They're being silenced. And for me, no more silence. Let's get on. Let's tell our stories and let's stand for God and who he stands for. And let's honor him in everything that we do. And that's my goal for the Clarity Podcast. Okay. Well, Claire, I really appreciate you coming on the program today and talking about this. And you know, I'm thinking, okay, uh, we're going to hop off here in a little bit and I'm going to upload this thing to YouTube and we'll see if I get a strike. I hope not. I uh, I don't think we will, but it's just really fascinating to me that the person that comes on my program to talk about crit criticizing and pushing back against the dominant narrative, uh, it wasn't that long and and it was taken. Um, uh, I, I guess, we'll, I don't know if there will, maybe one day we'll find an alternative platform we could release the original on, uh, you know, maybe that we could think of that. But again, this is these are the this is the world we live in. These are the rules that we're supposed to go by. I'm as a libertarian, I'm a little resentful of corporations that would tell us what we can or can't say on our on our platforms. But I, I recognize that I am on a corporate platform, so so I do I do have to play by the rules that they've established, and that's what we're going to do at NBR. We're we're not we're here to be friends. We're not trying to cause any trouble. We're just trying to get good information out there, and more importantly. Uh, hearing your story, you know, I think, and, and again, many of you probably agree and disagree with a lot of things she says, but I think we all can agree that it's important that Claire's voice be heard and that the people she's talking to on her podcast, the Clarity Podcast, are also listened to as well. And, you know, because once you can hear people's stories, you can have a better understanding where they're coming from. And when you are a Latter-day Saint and you have family and friends that are leaving the church, I, I I think that a place like this, the Clarity Podcast, and again, it's not, she only has 59 subscribers on YouTube. She just got started. Um, she just started with videos. She was originally just doing audio. Now she's doing video format. So you can watch the podcast as well. Okay. And you have this opportunity to listen and hear these people's stories. These are people who are Latter-day Saints who have since moved on. And, uh, and you need to talk, these are people like your family and friends that you know. And this would be a good opportunity to hear what they have to say, where they're coming from. And it would I hope that it would cause you to have empathy for people that are different than you. That's what we try to do on this program is to let everybody speak, let everybody tell their story. And then you and the audience can pray about, pray about what the things you hear on this channel, right? Um, but some, I think some people think a lot, there's a lot of good this channel does. I think some people don't like some of the guests that I have. But again, the key thing is we want to talk to everybody. Claire, um, I want to thank you so much for coming on the program today. I was just wondering if you had any final words uh, for the audience. 
Yeah, I think I would also like to point out just before we close here that, you know, I get this question and this comment a lot. Claire, why are you tearing down the church? Why are you so anti-Mormon? Are you? How did you become so anti-Mormon when you used to be such a woman of God? And I always kind of chuckle when I get that comment because if anything, I am not anti-Mormon. I am, if anything, I'm pro-Mormon. I'm anti-evil. And I really think that all of us should be anti-evil. And so what I'm trying to say is not that all Mormons are bad or that all Mormons are going to hell. That's not my place to judge, <laughs> okay? But what I am here to say is that the Mormons who are experiencing these things within the church, number one, if you have questions about what's going on in the church, it's okay to ask those questions and it's okay to critically think about the things that are wrong in the church. And if you do choose to leave the church to follow Christ, you have a place. You have people who will love you and people who are thinking along the same lines as you are. You're not going to lose everything because you leave the church. And actually, I've experienced the opposite where because I left the church, I feel like I've gained everything. My relationship with Jesus is rich and beautiful. It's simple but it is deep and it runs through my veins. I feel freedom in Christ. And so I'm not anti-Mormon. I actually, I live in Mormonville, Utah. So it would be a little strange if I was anti-Mormon because I wouldn't get along with literally anyone. <laughs> okay. But I do, I get, I get along with lots of people and it's literally a matter of seeking for truth and seeking for what God wants us to know personally. Seek that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I actually I'm going to quote somebody who came on my podcast. Jesus Christ is your staff and your stay, and if you follow him and you have faith in him, he will give you everything that you need. So trust in Christ, he will give you everything that you need. Okay. Well, thank you for those final words there, Claire. And don't forget to check out her podcast. We'll have links in the description uh to some of the stuff that Claire talked about today, and uh we'd like to hear your comments. What did you think of this uh, interview? What did you think of Claire's story and her you and not kind of a unique journey, but she's finding there's a lot of people in that same space, and she's going to try to provide a safe space for a community of people, of like-minded individuals who consider themselves being part of the Restoration, believe that Joseph Smith is their prophet, seer, and revelator, was their founding prophet, seer, and revelator, and that the Book of Mormon is scripture, and then they love Jesus, and they love the Bible, and I think it's really important that they have a place that they feel comfortable at, and uh, I want to thank you, Claire, for, for doing this, coming on the show. I would love to hear what everybody has to think. Again, also there's links in the description for our, our, our channel store, mormonbookreviews.com, where you can get hats and t-shirts and all sorts of uh, hot chocolate mugs, uh, all those kind of things. And, uh, and But also if you want to financially support us on Patreon, PayPal, and Venmo, it's always greatly appreciated for people, for you, for, for that. I always, it's really awesome. Uh, I couldn't do this without you. It really, it helps fund my trips out to Utah and throughout the country. It enables me to be able to give presentations at the John Whitmer Historical Association and Mormon History Association. And also don't forget that this April, I will be in uh, Utah to uh, be giving the keynote address at the uh, Firm Foundations Conference, uh, the, the Rob Meldrum's group. And that's April 18th. You can get tickets right now. Uh, it's early bird special up till March 15th. So make sure you get tickets to come and hear me speak at the Book of Mormon Expo, 7 o'clock. And I'll probably be doing a meetup on Wednesday the 17th, the night before, for those of you who want to maybe more intimate affair. We usually get about 20 to 30 people come to my meetups, and I try to talk to everybody. I can't talk long times with you, but I want to at least, I like to have at least conversations where we can at least talk for a few minutes. You can meet me and, and get to know me. And I love, more importantly, getting to know you. That's really the most important thing, is, is the lovely people that, that I love so much and have brought so much joy in my life. And have done so much for me. I think I'm, I'm just really appreciative of everything and everybody. And I appreciate people like Claire and being able to come on and tell her story. And remember, the most important thing is this. All the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.